Hi, my name is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to share easy to understand evidence-based holistic insights to help you master the game of building wealth. Just a reminder, if you have any questions, feedback or anything like that you want to send to me, you can send that to me at questions at investopoly.com.au. I'd be delighted to receive your feedback. Okay, let's jump into today's topic, which is all about investment property cash flow and how does it behave longer term and what do you need to consider or think about with respect to planning for the future and obviously how that property is going to interact with your overall retirement strategy. Now, of course, you know, we're talking about the negative cash flow of property. If we go and buy a property and we borrow to pay for that property, including all its costs, almost always, in fact, always, the rental income that you receive from that property won't be enough to pay for all its expenses plus the loan repayments. And of course, you'll be able to claim a tax deduction for that loss, which, you know, reduces it considerably, almost by half if you're in the highest marginal tax rate. But at the end of the day, there's going to be a real cash flow cost to hold on to that property. Now, obviously, the idea behind investing is that, you know, if I keep that property for many decades, that the compounding capital growth will dwarf whatever cash I've had to put into it. So that is, you know, if a property's cost me two or $300,000 to hold for 20 years, is on an after-tax basis. So that's my contribution towards the asset. But the capital gain after tax is, let's say, $3 million because I've held the property for a long period of time. That's how I'm going to earn my return. I've essentially outlaid two or 300000 And when I sell the property, I'll get a couple of million dollars in my pocket and it's happy days. Now that's all good in theory, but in reality, we need to plan for that cash flow. So how long will the property be negative cash flow for? To what extent? What implications that have on my retirement strategy? And is there anything that I can do to improve the cash flow of the property? Because that's ultimately going to improve my investment returns. Now, of course, property is a growth asset. I think of it like a growth asset. I use it as a growth asset in investment strategies. And a growth asset means that essentially most of your total return is going to come in the form of compounding capital growth and proportionately a much smaller amount as income from investment. Obviously, growth plus income equals your total investment return. And look, most properties, particularly residential properties, are going to produce quite a small income after all expenses. They're not going to be an income seller style asset, but that's okay because that's not the role of property within an investment strategy. The strategy shouldn't be, look, I own this property portfolio. It's going to throw off a whole lot of rental income. And that rental income will be enough for me to fund retirement. That could work if you've got a very long time horizon or you've got very high yielding property somehow and very little debt. But the reality is for most people, that strategy is not going to work. The role that property will play in a retirement strategy is it'll underpin other assets. So for example, you might, and I've spoken about this many times before, you might start drawing on super and you might need to draw aggressively on super initially to fund living expenses in retirement. And as a result of that, your super balance might be going down. It might be reducing each year because you're drawing out more than what the fund has earned. Now, that would be a risky thing to do if you didn't have any other assets to fall back upon. But if, for example, you've got a really good quality investment property portfolio, maybe a couple of properties that are compounding in growth each year on average two or $300,000, and let's say you're spending $120,000 a year, then you're going to be feel pretty comfortable about eating into your super balance, knowing that, hey, in 10, 15 years time, I'll sell one of these properties and it will replenish all my savings. And I've always got another one to sell down the track too, if I need to do that. That's the role that property will play in a retirement strategy typically speaking. So therefore, if we're not investing in property for the income, we don't necessarily need a lot of income when we enter into retirement from the property portfolio. However, what we don't want is the property portfolio to be taking money out of our pocket. We don't want it to be costing us a significant amount. We don't want to get into retirement and have to spend $50,000 on negative property investment cash flow. The goal typically I like for my clients, or I'll always aim for for my clients, is the property to be at least neutrally geared 
need to have a neutral cash flow by the time we get into retirement. That means, look, sure, I'm not going to get any income from it, but by the same token, it's not going to cost me anything as well. And the other important factor to consider in retirement is your interest rate sensitivity. We want to have a lower sensitivity to interest rates because we're going to be reliant solely on investment income to meet any interest costs. And so you don't want to really panic if the RBA is going to hike interest rates next month. You know, maybe then you've got to start compromising on your retirement and cancelling a holiday or something like that. You don't want to be in that situation. You don't want to have to worry about money or interest rates. And so therefore, you really want to have a lower level of gearing in retirement so that you're in that position. So let's then talk about, you know, what is a realistic expectation? How is cash flow going to behave with respect to property? And then we can uncover, I've done some numbers around this, we can uncover what are some of the things that we can do to improve the cash flow and how will that all work out? So let's look at our base case. Our base case is, you know, how long will a property be negative cash flow for? And so I did some projections. I assumed a property worth a million dollars, an initial gross rental yield of two and a half percent, which suggests it's a house. Now there's properties around Australia that are going to yield higher than that for a million dollars could be three or three and a half percent. I guess I've just been a bit conservative. A rental income growing at 4.3% per annum, which is really the long-term average. So that's not going to grow in line necessarily with the capital growth rate, but 4.3% and a 6% interest rate. Look, the interest rates are probably close to six and a half, seven percent kind of in that range at the moment. But again, we're doing some long-term projections and I've assumed a 39% income tax rate for the negative gearing. Now, of course, I've also included 35% of gross rental income to allow for direct property expenses like maintenance and insurances and property management and those sorts of things. And as you'd be aware, a few months ago, I talked about the holding costs that have over the last four years, they've really sort of increased from, they used to be about 25%. Now they're about 35% of gross rental income. And these numbers suggest that a property's sort of cash flow starts to become, let's call it relatively neutral, which is plus or minus $5,000 a year between year 25 and year 35. Now, remembering that's with a property with a 2.5% gross rental yield. So relatively low yield, but you know, for Melbourne and Sydney, that would be kind of a reasonable assumption to make. So I think, you know, not a lot of people think when they go into property investment, that they're going to have to support this investment for at least 25 years. You know, most people don't understand that's, you know, how the cash flow is necessarily going to behave. And whilst rents have been increasing considerably over the last couple of years, and will probably continue to rise by an amount greater than average over the next couple of years as well. Whilst that happened, we can't forget the last sort of 10 or 15 years, rents have actually been growing at below average rates. So I've assumed 4.3%. That's a long-term average since the early 90s, but you know it doesn't happen every year as well. Now, we also know this is very sensitive to interest rates. So it's possible in some cycles, particularly if rates are lower than normal, that properties will turn positive cash flow sooner than that. I also should say that I haven't included any allowance for land tax in my numbers. So if you have a lot of other holdings, then you know the incremental additional property that you add is going to probably attract a sizable land tax bill. So 25 years, probably too long for most people right? If we want to, you know, unless we're 25 years away from retirement, then we probably don't need to worry about it. But if we're closer than 25 years from retirement or wanting to have the flexibility to retire, then we need to start thinking about, well, how can we improve this cash flow? So of course, the obvious one is debt reduction, you know, and making some contribution towards gradually reducing the debt associated with the investment. And so what I did, I did some numbers, assuming you put in $1,000 a month, so $12,000 a year into the offset account, which a lot of people would probably be able to do. And if you did that, instead of the property turning sort of neutral-ish between year 25 and 35, it'd be within 20 years. So that'll sort of save you a bit of time. Somewhere between 19 and 25 years, the property starts to become immaterial from a cash flow perspective. So that's something, you know, a little bit more palatable, I think. You know, again, if you're in your early 40s, you know that if you do that over the next 20 or so years, you know, you'll get to the point 
point where the property will be pretty manageable by the time you get to retirement. The other thing we can do is make capital improvements. Now, when going and buying a property, I, I want to make sure this is really clear. When we go and buy a property, the most important thing to do is to acquire the highest quality asset we can afford. That really means spending most of our money on the land value in the best location we can afford. So we want good land and we want that land to be well located. Not too worried about how much land, as in whether it's 200, 100 square meters or 600 square meters. It's really about the quality of that land and it being a great location. Now we want to focus on that initially because we can always improve the dwelling in the future, but what you can never change is the location, right? The location is kind of locked in, but you can always have the flexibility to change the dwelling, whether you or the next purchaser. Now, the problem with this approach, however, is that quite often because we're spending more money on land value and less on the improvements, it often means that the rental yield is lower. But this is both a pro and a con. Obviously, the downside is the income. You know, it's going to cost you more to hold that particular asset. But the upside is it gives you room to make improvements, to add value and potentially create equity while doing adding that value. And there's two benefits from that. Firstly, of course, you're going to improve the income profile of the asset. So you're going to improve the rental yield. And secondly, you're going to get some depreciation benefits because of course we can claim a tax deduction for the cost of making those improvements. Of course that deduction might not have to be spread over many years but we're going to be able to tax deduct the improvements that we, we make. So using the exact same assumptions I assume we spend $100,000 on this million dollar property and improve the initial gross rental yield from 25 to 3.7% and I just pulled these figures out of the air by the way and if I did that remember the base case was it turning sort of neutral cash flow in 25 to 35 years. Well, if I make the improvements, it too will mean that the cash flow of the property will be neutral 19 to 25 years. So very similar to the debt reduction thing. And so if I did both, so that is put $1,000 a month into the offset account and also spend 100000 initially after I purchased the property to make cosmetic improvements to improve the yield. So if I did those two, it would be neutrally geared around 14 years. You know, that's considerably better than 25 to 30 years, right? And if you're in your mid 30s, it means you can go and buy an investment property asset, a really good quality asset, make some improvements to that asset to improve its yield, and then put in $1,000 a month into the offset account over the next 15 years, and you've got yourself an asset that's going to look after itself from a cash flow perspective when you enter into retirement. Now, the other thing you could do is sell an asset, right? So you might say, well, I'm going to hold these three investment properties, and then just after retirement, I'm going to sell one, and I'm going to use the net sale proceeds to repay the debt, maybe not all the debt, but at least some of the debt to really improve the cash flow. And that could be a strategy. But you know, the other thing to think about is that you know you invested in these properties so that they underpin super or whatever other assets you have to benefit from that compounding capital growth, even as you are enter into or deep into retirement. And so selling an asset, you know, just after you retire actually goes against that. It might mean that you've got fewer growth assets and you might not be able to achieve the sort of level of wealth that you need need to accumulate. But if that's not the case, like if it's surplus assets, selling a property to reduce debt could be a strategy. And I guess it's one of the benefits of having multiple investment properties. You know, if you have two or more investment properties, you always have the flexibility if you need to, to sell one and keep one. You can keep one to still enjoy that compounding capital growth, sell one to deal with the debt and cash flow issues. It's always a good plan B to fall back upon. So you you know your plan A might be debt reduction and improve the asset, etc. But if that actually doesn't come off or you're not able to do that because of unforeseen circumstances, well then that plan B of selling one asset and keeping one asset is always a good thing to have up your sleeve. So I think the key takeaway from this episode today is really to go away and forecast, you know, what you expect your property portfolio to do if you are a property investor of course. And if you're not a property investor, but you plan to be in the future, understand how cash flow will behave. Now, if you're really young and you've got a lot of time until you want to enter into retirement, you probably don't need to worry about it. Time will do its thing. But if you're closer to retirement, it's possible you might need to take active steps like some of the things I've just spoken about in order to improve your cash flow. And before I get into some listener questions today, I really want to reiterate because I've been speaking a lot about about 
income, I want to reiterate that there's really two fundamental key steps associated with being successful with respect to investing in property. The first step is acquiring a property that has the highest quality asset that your budget can allow. So really buying in the best location, irrespective of yield, irrespective of the dwelling and the improvements on that land, do your best to get into that asset. And then second, after you've acquired the asset, your focus should then switch to maximizing its cash flow. So that is improving the rent, making sure you reduce interest costs through using a mortgage broker to sort of shop your debt around and also maybe some debt reduction through accumulating savings in an offset account And then lastly, of course, optimizing the tax outcomes associated with investing in property to ensure that, again, you're going to improve your after-tax cash flow. Okay, so let's get into some listener questions. Got a few good ones for you today. As always, really, there's no bad ones. The first one's from Rowan, and it's a bit disjointed, like a bit all over the place, but I'll read them anyway. So firstly, Rowan writes, I found the episode on superannuation really informative, but I'd love to hear a more in-depth exploration of wrap products. Could you delve into the benefits, drawbacks, and top options available? So thanks for the tip, Rowan, and also thanks for the feedback and suggestion. I'll put it on the list. I've got a few things that I want to sort of talk about in that episode, but look out over the next few weeks. Hopefully I'll get time to jot my thoughts down. Rowan also goes on to write, consider inviting industry or subject matter experts as guests to share their insight and experiences. You know, there's that saying, you can please some of the people all the time or all of the people some of the time. My aim, and I just wanted to clarify this, so thanks for the feedback, Rowan, and suggestion. It is a really good one. A lot of podcasts invite guests on. It's not really the aim for me. The aim of this podcast was really to create another way to really consume my blog. So if you didn't want to read it, you can listen to me prattle on about it. And that was the key aim, and that's how I sort of differentiate my podcast from others. So my goal is not really to invite guests in the future. Anything could change in the future, but that's not the strategy at the moment. Moment. But I plan to do a bit more of that on YouTube, by the way. So where I'm, I plan to do some stuff on there, whether it's a live event or whatever, on the Investopoly YouTube channel. So look out for that. Rowan goes on, please provide more resources or links to the supporting materials in your show notes. Look, the show notes are pretty sparse. They give a sort of just description of today's episode. Again, my aim is really, if you listen to the episode and you like it, what I suggest is go and have a read or look at the blog on the website. But quite often I use charts and tables and those sorts, they're really difficult to sometimes convey in a verbal sort of format on a podcast. And then also in the blogs on the website, I always have links through if there's anything particularly interesting or I'm citing some research or report, I'll include links there. So, and also include a link to that blog actually in the show notes. So that's where you'll find all the links for you, Rowan, and for anyone else that's interested. And finally, Rowan writes about or asks questions about AI, so artificial intelligence. You know, how will it help investment products and drive investment decisions and those sorts of things. And I'm certainly no expert in AI by any stretch of the imagination, but my view on AI at the moment with respect to its application in financial planning is that I think AI will be able to provide quite basic strategic advice. It aims to do that now. I'm sure it's going to get better at doing that. But for example, you know, it'll get to a point where someone could jump in and write out a sort of brief description of their situation. Maybe they're young they've got some savings, a small super, and this is their income. You know, should they go and buy an investment property or should they borrow to invest in shares or should they do something else? You know, someone then with a simplistic situation, I think AI is going to be able to solve that problem and give, and then maybe they could write then, okay, prove it to me mathematically that this is going to work out best. And then maybe the following step is then how do I implement that and which ETFs or, you know, what style of property do I need to buy? Maybe we'll get to a point that it'll do that. And I think AI will certainly help advisors achieve more productivity. So, you know, it might assist with an asset allocation analysis. So if I construct a portfolio, maybe I can run it through AI and tell me, you know, what am I missing here or how could I improve this portfolio? But I don't think AI is going to replace the pure advisor relationship. And hopefully that's not me being naive, but, you know, I think we're hardwired for people to trust people. People don't really trust machines. And so I think AI will be a great productivity tool, but I don't think it's necessarily going to replace the advisor relationship or the role of the advisor has in in developing strategic advice for a client. But it's a great question, Rowan, and thanks so much for your, all your feedback. I greatly appreciate it. It's a very 
interesting space to keep a watch of, of course. Okay, the next question is from Jason and he says he's a regular listener and he finds the podcast fantastic. So thanks so much for your feedback, Jason. Jason writes, I've got a question regarding capital gains. Will it make a difference to me whether I sell my investment property before or after I retire? I plan to retire in about five years and the property, which he purchased for 180000 in 2005, is worth between six fifty and 700000 today. And Jason owns 50% of that property with his brother. Jason goes on to write, I understand capital gains tax will apply when we sell. If we sell before I retire, will that mean I will pay more tax? For example, is the capital gains added to my earnings at the rate I am get, get taxed on. Okay, Jason, you didn't tell me what your income was, but let's assume it's 100000 just as a sort of round figure. So let's work out the capital gain. If you sell the property for 700 now I'm going to ignore purchasing and selling costs here, but just for the sake of this calculation, but of course you have to include them. But let's say you sell the property for 700 you bought it for 180 so that's a gross gain of 520000 between you and your brother. Because you've held it for more than 12 months, you can discount that gain by 50%. So therefore, your brother and you have a net gain of 260000 And because you own 50% of that property, your share of that gain is 130000 If you sell that while you're working, so pre-retirement, and as I said, let's assume you earn 100000 then in the year that you sell that asset, your income is 100000 plus 130000 taxable gain. Your taxable income will therefore be 230000 which means you will pay a total tax amount that year of $74,500, which essentially is $51,500 more than what it would be if you didn't have the capital gain. So really, the gain that you've made, the 130, the net gain that you made, you paid $51,000 of tax on that gain. Now, if you sold it when you retired and assuming you have no other taxable income, so you might receive a pension from super, for example, but that's not taxable. Then if all you recorded was the gain in that year, the 130000 discounted gain, your tax liability would be $32,500, which is $19,000 less than what you would have paid if you sold the property when you're working. So the answer is yes, most likely. I don't know your full circumstances, but using that as an example, if it's close to that, you would be much better off waiting and selling the property in retirement. And that's because the net discounted gain is added to your taxable income in the year that you sell that property. By the way, if people want to do these calculations in terms of, you know, how much tax would I pay? There's a great calculator online that I use. It's called paycalculator.com.au. That's the website, paycalculator.com.au. It's really useful and it's very accurate. It's something that I use on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, the next question is from Vishal. He says, what would a well-diversified low-cost ESG ETF portfolio look like with an investment time horizon of 30 years? ESG is an acronym stands for Environmental, Social and Global. Let's call it ethical investing, if you like. And so what Vishal's asking, is how would I structure a portfolio that's going to give him Australian international small cap and emerging market exposure across the board? I don't really like answering these questions in terms of how would I structure a portfolio. And there's a couple of reasons for this. I did do one, it's not an ESG portfolio. I did do one on YouTube recently where I sort of structured a portfolio and I sort of explained my way through it just as an example. But, you know, there's kind of two problems with me or reluctances with me sort of answering this question or sharing it. The first one is it's quite time sensitive. You know, I might structure a portfolio because I want to overexpose a portfolio to some certain opportunities or underexpose it to some certain risks that present today. Now, those risks might play out over the next couple of years. So in two years time, the structure of the portfolio could change because I'm entering into the market at a different time. So it is kind of time sensitive. But secondly, and probably most importantly, it's my intellectual property, something that I've honed over the last 20 plus years and spent a lot of time researching and thinking about. And ultimately, that's why my clients pay me you know, on a regular basis because they're accessing sort of that on a regular basis. So I don't really want to throw it out there just because I think I try and share as much as I can on the podcast and try and be as generous as I can, but I don't want to be silly about it. And out of respect for, you know, the relationship I have with my clients, they're handing over their hard-earned dollars to benefit from this. So I don't necessarily want to turn around behind their back and give it away to someone that I have no, I never met for free. So sorry, Vishal, I know that's not a, the answer you're looking for 
but thanks for your question anyway. Okay, the next question is from someone that actually didn't give me their name. Look, it's always nice to throw your name in there so I can refer back to you. I'll read the first part of the question. He goes, he or she goes, I've got a maths and numbers question for your consideration. You've already pricked up my attention as an analytical person. I love the maths. I want to pitch some calculations at you without having any idea where it will land. First off, with the mortgage at the moment, I'm considering my offset account as a de facto risk-free rate. Let's say 6.5%, but you probably have a better idea of the average rate these days. This is a tax-free in a sense, so the rate you would have to earn to match that would have to be 6.5% after tax. And then the person goes on to say, well, here's a few scenarios. You know, do I put money in the offset account? Do I invest in ETFs? Do I put it into super, etc., etc.? And essentially, the person's asking, you know, what is the best outcome? Which sounds like a very maths-based question it's actually not really and I can answer it really easily. Look, essentially what this person's saying is it's a risk-free rate. You know, if you put money in your offset account, let's call it a non-tax deductible home loan. The person's right. It's going to be about 6.5%-ish, sort of around that mark, maybe low sixes. And if you put the money in the offset, that's the interest that's going to save you. To be better off, you would have to earn 6, 6.5% after tax, which probably means you need to earn, you know, eight or nine percent, depending on your tax rate, maybe even more. And let's not forget, if you put the money in your offset account, it's a risk-free return. You're guaranteed that you're always going to save that money. Whereas you put it in the market, there's obviously some risk associated with that. So essentially, I published a podcast on the 12th of July, 2023. And the headline of that podcast is, should you invest or repay your home loan? A long-term perspective. And and so I would invite you to have a look at that podcast. Essentially, what you need to do is you need to compare what is the return, the investment return you can get on an after-tax basis versus your home loan interest rate. That's the first step is just to compare those returns. The second step then is to factor in the risk. Because obviously the home loan return is risk-free, it's guaranteed. The investment return is not. And we know that markets can be volatile over time. So the investment return is uncertain. So I would say that if you have a very low risk tolerance, then the home loan starts to look better. If you are close to retirement, you know, so you can't really stomach much volatility, then I would say the home loan return is better. If you have a high risk tolerance and or you're a long way from retirement, then I would say you probably do have an appetite for higher risk and the investment returns might be better. So in that podcast on the 12th of July, 2023, I looked at the historic returns from say the Australian market and I concluded that the after-tax return from investing in the share market, depending on your tax rate, which is why I'll give you a range, is somewhere between 7 and 7.8%. Well, if you can earn 7 to 7 8% over the long term, chances are that's going to be higher than your home loan rate. Maybe not by much, maybe only by sort of 1 to 1 1.7. You know, if we think about a long-term average interest rate of say 6 or maybe 5.5. So it's reasonable, but it comes then back down to time horizon and your risk tolerance. And if you're prepared to take a bit of risk and or you, know, you don't really care about the volatility over the next 10 years, as long as you'll be better off in 20 years time, well, then investing is probably better. You know what? The reality is I reckon I'd take an each way bet. I would probably go 50-50, put a bit in the offset, a bit into the share market or growth assets or super with a slight leaning towards more growth assets and less debt reduction. But, you know, 50-50 wouldn't be so bad. So I don't need to do the numbers. It's really just looking at those after-tax returns, everything else compounds, and you just ultimately need to compare those two returns. But thank you for your question, whoever you are. <laughs> Okay, just a quick minder. As I've mentioned many, many times before, there's a checklist you can download. 97 points. It gives you a, a bit of a checklist you can run your eyes down to see if there's anything that you should be doing or thinking about in your position. And chances are, if there is, I've probably recorded a podcast or written a blog about it. There's 450 blogs on the website. So I think if you jump on there and do a search, I think you'd be surprised at how much crap I've written over the years. All right. Okay. So that's it for me today, folks. Until next week. Bye for now.